This week on The Best of the West, we head for the wilds of Alaska with pro staff member Dan Adler as he pursues grizzly bear and doll sheep. Then to the remote backcountry of Wyoming, Jim Sessions and Shane Gerhardt guide Chuck McCoy on a do-it-yourself trophy elk hunt. All this and more, including the recovery of Kevin Norman's grizzly bear from last week's episode. Keep it here on The Best of the West. Previously on the Best of the West. A boar and a sow came out and were messing around up high in the snow. When we got up there, the weather kind of went to pod on us. You could see where they'd tracked out. We followed them a ways and then they dropped down into the bushes and cut down through some alders, got up to the next ridge. It starts pouring rain at that point. Just blow those alders. There's a big boar and a big sow and they're bedded down. It's about to get real. I dialed in my Huskamo scope, 412 yards. As the rain kept pounding down, raining harder and harder. They was finally up and my heart was about pounding out of my chest. I had a brown bear in my crosshairs. I chose to bring the 28 Nosler, shooting the 175 Hornady ELDX. Now we get to go find him with a big sow in there all pissed off. <laughs> the sow won't leave over there, so we've got to go in. It's getting late. So we make our way over to where the boar last went in the brush, not knowing where that sow is. And if you want to talk about intense, There he lies. Dropped right in his tracks and rolled down the hill 10 yards into the brush and was piled up in the alders. So I'll just stay away, we'll be golden. What a rush. <laughs> to say I had buck fever or brown bear fever, I don't know what you call it, was an understatement, but. <laughs> Thanks, Cheddar. You bet, bud. <laughs> it's persistence right there. The Hornady 175 ELDX put the smack down on this bad boy. Best of West system to have the confidence that you know you're going to get it done is a serious peace of mind. Thanks, buddy. You bet. Thanks, Ash. You bet. That's a team effort. Persistence. Persistence, brother. I really can't say enough about Chet and the hard worker he is and busting his butt to make your hunt a success. If you live up here in Alaska and you're interested in a Best of the West rifle or Huskama optics, we offer shooting schools, both on the road system and out at my fishing lodge on the Mulchatna River. Love to have you come out and get your system dialed in, ready for next hunting season. When the best of the West continues, Dan Adler heads for higher ground in search of an Alaskan grizzly of his own. Immerse yourself in the outdoor experience. It will cleanse your soul and make you a better person. Fred Bear.
You know, of the North American 29, few strike as much pride, fear, and respect as the doll sheep. And in my relationship with the Wild Sheep Foundation, I'm privileged to be a published author in their quarterly publication. I knew in preparation for this hunt, I wanted to write something special, and I knew I wanted to dedicate it to someone special. So I dedicated this hunt, and more importantly, my training, six months of grueling two-a-day workouts, sometimes three-a-day workouts, to my daughter, Rebecca Lynn. Babe, this one's for you. As I sit here to write this edition of The Outfitter's Corner, I am marveled by the events transpiring around me that are too cosmic to be coincidence. You see, today is my 40th birthday, and in less than 48 hours, I leave for Alaska to hunt all sheep and grizzly bear with good friend and longtime Wild Sheep Foundation donor, Joe LaTarte in Alaska Wilderness Enterprises. Doll sheep struck a chord deep inside me during my very first visit to Joe's camp, and now to return there as a hunter, well, most of you know exactly what's going through my mind and exactly how I feel. So what is it about sheep hunting that changes your entire persona, your entire routine, the entire way you think about hunting? What is it about sheep hunting that has you reading books from authors you had heard about growing up but never stop to actually read their words. What is it about sheep hunting that truly challenges everything you thought you knew about hunting? What is it about sheep hunting that has you reading your gear checklist over and over and over until it's damn near memorized? To almost 30 members of the best of the West, I cannot say how honored I am to be representing this fantastic company, the pioneers of the long range and ethics shooting movement. From day one, you treated me as if I had been there from the beginning. I have found my second home in the outdoors with everyone at Best of the West. You each motivate me to make world-class televised hunts, representing the best long-range hunting and shooting products with the best hunters and outfitters on the planet. Lastly, to that warrior ram standing proud on that mountainside in the Alaska range, may my bullet fly true, and may I be worthy, humble, and appreciative of every moment in your world. God bless America. Yours in the outdoors, Dan Adler. We made about a half mile hike to the cabin. And Joe's remote wilderness cabin has a lot of history, including hunters like Fred Bear and Clem Clemens, in fact, I got a kick out of reading the book Joe Keeps in Camp and listening to Fred Bear, almost hearing his words in my head as I read his book, describe the cabin while sitting in the same cabin and feeling the history of those men around me. It was a goosebump moment then, and it still is now. I had the privilege of meeting Joe and Vicki Latart about 10 years ago. We've been great friends ever since. Joe was one of the most accomplished guides in all of Alaska for doll sheep, grizzly bear, moose, brown bear, fishing, and more. But more than that, he's a great American and a great friend. I've been guiding for 37 years. I started out in the Brooks Range and ended up here in the Alaska Range for doll sheep. Doll sheep is a very special form of hunting. What you should expect when you come to Alaska is pristine environment and good sheep populations. That's what we have right now. But it's not a slam dunk. It's not a go out and mail order thing where you walk up and we have the sheep around the corner for you. It's a lot of hard work. And if you're not willing to work hard, and if you're not willing to work out and have the right equipment before you get here, chances are you're not going to be successful. That's why sheep hunting is so attractive and so popular. All of us have read the writings of Jack O'Connor and other famous hunters. And even then they said that sheep hunting was the most special, the most challenging hunting in North America, or early the world, and it is. And even if you go and are unsuccessful, you will always remember that trip because once you get up above Alpine, it's just a whole nother place. When the best of the West returns, we pack into Elk Camp in Northwestern Wyoming with Chuck McCoy and Team Huskamaw. The best of the West is brought to you by the Wild Sheep Foundation, Cryptek Camo, Hawkins Precision, Defiance Custom Actions, 
Hornady, accurate, deadly, dependable. Huskama Optics and LongRangeStore.com. My name is Chuck McCoy. I live in Bellingham, Washington, and I am the owner of Flatline Ops. I've always enjoyed hunting all my life from a kid. Uh, my dad brought me up shooting in Pennsylvania, and I've always loved the outdoors and appreciated nature at its best. Going back for an elk, I've shot some elk before, but nothing huge. These guys felt that we could go in there and get something worthwhile. In talking to Shane, who uh, takes all the orders at Best of the West and a man of all means there, he, we were talking about elk hunting and I've always hunted, loved to hunt, hunted in Montana for 25 years and never hunted in Wyoming. So he said, we should get an elk tag. So I purchased a commissioner's tag through the Elk Foundation, which I'm very happy that the money went to them. And we planned with Jim Session this trip to the mountains. Well, we're getting ready to go into our elk hunt. Uh, Shane Gearhart and Chuck McCoy have elk tags here in northwestern Wyoming. Uh, I just got back last week from my wife's hunt where we were successful uh, taking a, a really nice six-point bull. But one of the deals here with livestock is sometimes they get a little injury or something. And this horse here, Little House, has a puncture wound on his right front. We've got it wrapped, and we're going to have to wrap it. Uh, a couple more days. The real trip is the trip in and the trip out. You, you trust your life on these mules and horses, which are unbelievable. We went in the mountains on trails that were thousands of feet straight down on both sides. We had snow, we had wind. Wind was terrible. My face is all beat up from the wind. I gotta say something about Rufus. Rufus was my mule. And Rufus, he is a, just a sweetheart. Um, Cadillac, man. Duck fly, four wheel drive, can't touch him. Soft, easy riding. Just the greatest critter I've ever been on in my life. Is, is I'd walk down, sometimes would walk down downhills, give him a break. And if I was going a little slow, he'd be pushing me with his nose in my back. And we were laughing about that. But quite a group of really experienced horses and mules that make, again, what could be a tragedy, a fun experience. And all the guys were just like mountain men. Uh, they were horse, horsemen mule men, whatever, they could take care of all these critters and uh, took me in places that, you know, scared me and I'm not afraid of nothing. We were lucky enough to get in there and set up camp on uh, Friday night. Next morning was actually pretty good. We hunted all day, sat up on a big open ridge, which the wind just killed us. The, it snowed on us. I think we saw maybe a handful of bulls, not shooter bulls, uh, hardly any cows at all. I think we're in a really good spot right here. We can have a bull come up out of this bottom or crossing this ridge line down below us here anytime. Stay tuned. After the break, it's opening morning for grizzly bears in Alaska.
It is no coincidence that the American hunter is the most patriotic of all our citizens. Who cares more for this land's beauties than he? Fred Bear. One of my favorite things about hunting the Alaska Range is something that reminds me of home and it's one of the things I like about sheep hunting in general and that's that it's a glassing and glassing and glassing style hunt. My guide for most of this adventure was Will Kellner who's guided with me in Arizona for many years. He's a great young man and really knows how to judge these sheep and bears. So we had a really good time and I knew I was in great hands. This country is literally saturated with doll sheep, grizzly bear, moose, wolves, and other Alaska big game species. So a hunter needs to be constantly on guard when going through the alders and the spruce to make sure that he or she is always paying attention to their environment. The guide will always be ready for a shot if necessary. This hunt is no joke, it's the real deal. But being surrounded by that much wildlife, being in that remote and unspoiled wilderness, make the risks worthwhile when you know you're protected on all sides. The third day of our sheep hunt was also the opener for the grizzly bear season. And because we'd been seeing bears every day up to that point, I was certain we probably wouldn't have that much luck on day three when the season was actually open. But only about an hour from the cabin, my guide Will said he had seen some bears moving through the thicket. If we go there, they're, they're kind of coming downhill. So we're gonna go all the way around this ridge and come up on the backside of them, above them, kind of where that yellow is, on that yellow ridge okay. and we'll look back down. And we knew we had some work to do. The biggest factor was the wind was 100% wrong from our position to the bear. The other thing is in this area, you can't shoot a sow with cubs, and really we wanted to target an older age class boar anyways. So not only did we have to get the wind and do a big hike, we also wanted to make sure we were after the right bear. It took us about an hour and a half just to get the wind right before we made another climb, probably 700 to 1,000 feet in elevation, where we could start to glass. When we got up to the top, the first spot we thought we might be able to pick them up, we didn't see them. We had to move to another vantage spot, which took about another 40 minutes. And at that point, we had found the bear and got the wind right, and we could now set up for a Huskama advantage once we knew it was the right bear. We glassed for a while, wanted to make sure that this was the right bear, and it was a bear that Will had recognized and was able to clearly identify from yardage as a boar. You know those long nose and those big paws and that hump on their back are that telltale sign that you're on a great bear. And we got to observe the color of this bear and we knew it was a perfect bear to take home back to Arizona. People ask a lot about buck fever and there's a lot of times where I get buck fever. But when I'm able to set up and lay on an animal for an hour or more like we had in this bear, my senses actually calm down and the longer I have to look at my target, the more and more I'm relaxed, which is opposite a lot of my clients and other hunters I know. But one of my favorite memories of this hunt was my guide Will telling me, look, that's only a 300 win. You need to be ready for a second shot. And I said, this isn't just your ordinary 300 win. This is custom loaded ammo and a fully custom rifle and has more kinetic energy and knockdown power than the average 300 win, even as far a shot as this is. He says, well, you need to be ready for a second shot. You need to be ready for a second shot. So it's all calm, ready to go. And now I'm thinking, man, Never guide the guide, right? So I gotta trust my guide will that I need to be ready for a second shot. Even though in my brain, having watched 60, 70 animals go down to this gun before, now I gotta be ready for a backup shot. I tell you what, when that bear stood up, I let that 300 win eat, and I think Will was impressed at the knockdown power of this rifle. As a lot of you may or may not know, I spent a lot of my life as an officer in the United States Air Force. And this was so cool. Not five minutes after I shot that bear, a United States Air Force C-17 Globemaster III did a flyover at us at not even a thousand feet. It was like a congratulatory flyby. It was so cool. Had I not shot that bear yet and that airplane flew over, we might have not got that bear at all. It may have spooked. Thank you, United States Air Force, and thank you to that air crew for making my day. A celebratory flyby of an Alaska grizzly bear. 
As you can see, we've had an amazing third day here at Wilderness Enterprises in Alaska. After about a two and a half mile walk, Will glassed up this great brown bear and uh, took us about an hour and a half to get in position for Huskama Advantage. We had the range, we had everything dialed in, the wind, and once the bear got up and started giving us uh, an opportunity for a clear shot, we took it and dropped a grizzly bear with one shot. That's the Huskama 5 to 30 with the Winchester 300 mag. Just an awesome day here in Alaska. Thank you, Will. Good job, congratulations. Thank you. One and done, it was a great shot, great bear, and great teamwork with everybody involved. After the break, Chuck McCoy gets lined up on a trophy of his own. Keep it right here on the Best of the West. The Best of the West is brought to you by the Wild Sheep Foundation, Cryptek Camo, Hawkins Precision, Defiance Custom Actions, Hornady, Accurate, Deadly, Dependable, Huskama Optics and LongRangeStore.com. For this week's product review, we'll be reviewing the newest addition to the Flatline Ops product line, the Voyeur. The Voyeur is a quick attach plate that provides quick and smooth adjustments to any spotting scope. For filming or spotting, the Voyeur makes it easy to stay on your target when it's go time. Without the Voyeur, making even the slightest adjustment can cause you to miss that moment of a lifetime. Got it. You get it? With the Voyeur, you simply tighten down your tripod and make the fine adjustments up or down or side to side. Made out of the best components available, the Voyeur is field tested and proven. For more information about this product or any of the other Flatline Ops products, please visit longrangestore.com. Flatline Ops, I started about 2008, and a really good friend of mine, him and I both collaborated. So I came up with my levels systems, the shooting bags. We make a wide variety of different aids for long range shooting. And I might say we make the best stuff in the world, bar none. How I got affiliated with uh, Best of West was, at the time, I wanted to get my name out there, get my products out there, but really didn't know how to do it. So I notified Jack and he took my products on, put them on some of his rifles, tried them, they loved the stuff, and the story goes on from there. They sell all of our products. Uh, we have a great relationship between Flatline and Best of the West. Saw a lot of elk, but they seemed to be three to four miles away in each direction. So Jim had the good idea to come down here in a little sneaky hole he has here. We've walked the horses all the way down here. It's real steep. We're letting them eat a little bit of groceries. This is some really high protein stuff. So let them bulk up a little bit, and then we're going to tie them up and kind of make a day of it. We may make a loop. I'm not sure. Everything's kind of in range right here, so it's set up really nice. So. This is just a perfect place for a big bull to be hanging out. We might try to sweet talk him in, you know. It was really quite cool because I was kind of looking over in one direction and these guys were looking over. We were all covering this huge drainages. Uh, T, our cameraman, sitting next to me and Jim kind of hits him and tells him there's a big bull coming out of the woods and so T looks at me and he goes, hey, get your guns, you know, it's going to happen here. And he says, and I'm not kidding you. So I crawled around the backside. I got down on my gun and I'm looking through the scope and oh, I see him, he's kind of coming out of the woods and 
I go, oh my gosh, look at all that horn you got on. And so Jane's on my, now he's telling me, just quit looking at the horns. And I knew that something was going on. It didn't look quite right, but I, but I knew there was a lot there. Great setup, it was just perfect, 510 yards. Shane was helping me with get everything adjusted and set up, and that bull was picture perfect. If you're not working to protect hunting, then you're working to destroy it. Fred Bear. One morning, we watched a herd of bulls going upriver. The next day, we saw wolf tracks going downriver. And the third day, just showing you once again, we're not in Kansas anymore, we found a caribou bull in the river that had been killed and eaten by these wolves. And it's amazing how much carnage they cause in just a day. While not much has changed in this area as far as the history of hunting and the way we hunt, the hunting landscape in Alaska and at a national level has changed dramatically. We are pretty much at war here in Alaska with the federal government. The Fish and Wildlife Service has just passed uh, rules banning the baiting of grizzly bears over bait. This is sponsored by the National Park Service. Uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service picked it up and banned it with them along with BLM. The Forest Service is cutting user days on the forest and discouraging hunting opportunities. If we continue to go this route, hunting opportunities on all federal public lands will be drastically reduced. When I go around the shows, I see a lot of great people. I'd rather not be with anybody else but hunters. It's a fantastic opportunity to communicate and to talk to people of like-minded interests. We gotta remember that we are not unified as a group. It's gotta be more than just joining an organization and going home and forgetting about it. We have to participate individually in fighting these incursions into our hunting heritage. What you can do is to write letters to your congressmen and senators constantly. Every other month is not too much. Be in correspondence with them. Do join the major conservation organizations like Wild Sheep, NRA for your gun rights, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, Safari Club International. They're all great. But as individuals, it's up to you to take the fight yourself to your congressman in your state. One prime example of people not participating is when I go to meetings here in the local area and it's been publicized that there's going to be controversy over possibly banning some form of hunting or trapping or even fishing and a handful of people show up. We should be the majority at every meeting. Sometimes no people show up. Sometimes I'm the only one there and this has got to change. I know we're all busy. I know we all have families. I know the football season's real interesting. But if we want to continue hunting and we want to protect the heritage of hunting and we want to keep places like this special for us to enjoy, then we all better start showing up at every meeting and testifying as well as writing letters. It's up to each and every one of us to do our part. One of the greatest advantages of getting our grizz on day one of the grizz season is it gave us a full seven days to solely focus on a mature ram. We put on our big boy pants, strapped our boots, and it was going to be a long, wild ride. And Alaska didn't disappoint. How do you want to kind of get to them in the morning? Uh, in the morning, we'll come down the creek here. We'll cross where it's shallow. We'll take the creek bottom all the way up to the ridge. We'll take this ridge line up to that knob over there. And we'll sit on that knob and glass. And then we can see up the valley farther. And uh, Hopefully find those rams again. There's a band of eight. Um, we should be able to see them again in the morning. We picked up a band of rams, unfortunately for us, about five miles away. And at that distance, there was no way to see if they were legal. But we knew what we had to do. We went four or five hours back to camp, made a plan for the next day to spike out three or four hours, about three miles downstream, and then knew that that next morning when the sun arose, 
we'd still have yet another two to three hour hike to get in position to glass. Now if that sounded like a lot of time and a lot of walking, it was nothing in comparison to what happened next. Because once we were in position to glass the rams, they weren't there and we thought the gig might be up. Until Will found the rams about four miles upriver into the highest, nastiest part of that country where you'd expect a band of mature rams to go. Honestly, I was ready to pack it in and, and not even think more about those rams. But Will said, hey, there's got to be a legal ram with that many rams in the bunch. And I'll never forget when T said, there's the finish line. Let's go get them. And I thought, man, if these guys are ready to go, then I was ready to go. They inspired me and the walk was on. Would you believe it was another four or five hours just to get into position to find these rams again? Fortunately, we did. And you know what? We almost blew it. One of the rams had broken off and bedded down close to us. And when we were moving in position to find the larger band, we busted him. We hunkered down for a while and hoped he'd go back to feeding. Fortunately for us, he did. About a half hour later, we were able to sneak into about 700 yards from that band of rams. I knew that if there was a legal one in the group, that I was in a great spot for a prone shot. The Best of the West is brought to you by the Wild Sheep Foundation, Cryptech Camo, Hawkins Precision, Defiance Custom Actions, Hornady, Accurate, Deadly, Dependable, Huskama Optics, and LongRangeStore.com. Quarter to five, out walked the tripod bull. Shane was helping me with get everything adjusted and set up, and that bull was picture perfect. Congratulations, that is an awesome non typical bowl. That's a great yeah, that's cool. Oh my god. Right on, T. Good job, Chuck. All right. Traveled a Thanks, long guys. way for a bull like that, buddy. Oh my gosh, yeah. I'm so excited cool. for you. It's just patience. What we did was we snuck into this spot where we'd seen a lot of bulls about eight, ten days ago. And the majority of the elk have left, but this is just being patient, getting in a good spot, covering a lot of ground. That, that we know distances. 500 over here, 400 down here, 800 across here, and just effective big bull elk hunting here in the high absorkies of northwestern Wyoming. Let's go check him out. So after we shot him, rode down there, and it was kind of funny because uh, T Man, our cameraman, got there first, and he walked up and he said, uh, Holy whatever. And uh, Jim looked at me and he goes, yeah, you know, it's a good bull when the cameraman says that. So we got off and we, we all walked up there and I got to tell you, that bull was something else. He was way more than I think all of us thought. Jim said he knew he was big when we saw him. And he was really different. It's a trophy of a lifetime going on my wall. Ooh, you set the standard high, Chuck, on this hunt, <laughs> you son of a bitch. Yeah. <laughs> He's all or nothing. Couldn't ask for anything more. I mean, oh this is just yeah. public land bull coming in here, do it yourself hunting, best of the West. And, uh, Eskimo optics. You know, the, the, what'd you guys dial the turret to? 489. 489, compensating from up on that knob up there yeah. for some little bit of down angle. And, uh, just placed two bullets perfect right in his front shoulder and laid him out here so we'd have an easy job. Of, getting him boned out and taken care of just uh wow. very very few people kill bulls like this on public land and then coming in here doing it ourselves mm -hmm. using our stock and absolutely camping with them so we're within striking distance of them you know right from our camp it's 
It's the only way to hunt them. Very special. Thanks a lot, you guys. You're welcome, Chuck. You bet. You're welcome. You're a good rider and a good shot, man. Absolutely. is beyond words. The hunting aspect of it is a part of it and getting the game is a part of it but the trip itself and the camaraderie of the guys I went in with words can't describe it. Too much fun. Too much fun. We laughed, sat by campfire, we slept in a 10 by tent, little pup tent every night. You kind of learn each other's habits and and how each other thinks and feels. Uh, we made food for each other. We lived on burritos. And damn good. Love to do it again. You think you're in shape? Yeah, I can't touch the three of these guys I went in there with. But the older I get, the tougher it gets. Don't wait around. Do it while you have the chance to do it. Hopefully I get time with these guys again. Maybe some antelope or something. But it, it truly, I'll never forget. To book your Alaskan adventure and for more information about Alaska Wilderness Enterprises, please contact Joe at 907-488-7517 or visit online at wildernessenterprises.com. For more information about the products and gear used in today's show, please visit longrangestore.com or call 1-866-754-7618. If you consider an unsuccessful hunt to be a waste of time, then the true meaning of the chase eludes you altogether. Fred Bear. I knew that if there was a legal one in the group, that I was in a great spot for a prone shot, even at 700 yards. And after looking and looking and looking at two rams in that group, we determined once again, none of them were legal. The heartbreak was real, but the hike in was inspiring and very rewarding, and I would gladly do it again. The odds were in Dan's favor that at least one of the rams would be legal. When dealing with odds in Alaska, odds are it's going to rain. With only three days remaining, the forecast is not looking good. Having been rained out the last two days, Dan and guide Pat Ramiro will venture out in search of a legal ram on this, the last day of Dan's hunt. Bottom of the ninth, two outs, three balls, two strikes. And the sun's starting to go down and T's saying we're running out of camera light. We just kind of have to come to peace in our heart that this hunt's not gonna be successful. And I'm kind of coming to terms with that. And then Pat makes the call, guys, it's not gonna be safe. We're gonna have to pack up and go now. So as we stood up, I looked over his shoulder and I looked behind him, and there at about a mile, I could see four white dots. And I said, Pat, do me a favor, check those four. Put the spotting scope on the sheep. And T and I started looking back and forth at each other like, he's taking longer to look at these sheep than any other sheep. And then he kind of said in his Pat Romero guide voice, guys, I got four rams, and I think two of them are legal. We had to close a mile before we could even think about shooting. The sun's going down fast. And now we're almost at a jaw going through the Alaska tundra and upstream. We closed about high 600 yard range and now the rams are bedded. Lights still going down, fogs in and out. We can't shoot a bedded ram on television. And as we glass and glass, Pat says, yes, there's definitely two legal rams in the group. This one's the biggest and he puts me in the right direction. We get the range finder on this ram seven or eight times. We want to confirm the range. We want to confirm we're dialed in with that five by 30 Eskimo scope and we just need the rams to stand. And now the fog rolls in, and now T says we're losing light. Now Pat says we don't wanna go back in the dart, it's not safe. Finally, we decide we're gonna to have to take some kind of action to get this band of rams to stand up. 
So we decided we're going to resort to a tactic you've seen and experienced at the Huskamuck Challenge or maybe you've watched on our television program. And that's the infamous spot shot. It's where you purposefully shoot over the animal to not only get the animal to stand up, but also validate your wind call. And that was really the only option we had left. And a lot of viewers of the show have come and said to me over the years, you guys make it look so easy. I just wish you'd have one episode where it was more transparent and it really looked like work. Well, here's that episode, folks. We decided to go ahead and take the spot shot. Now, the great thing was the spot shot worked in the sense that we were able to validate our wind. And now in and out of the fog, the rams walked away one at a time and they're approaching 800 yards in about a 15 mile an hour crosswind when we got set up for a shot at about a 25 degree incline. Pat called the range three different times. I slowly calmed my breathing, got into a steady rate, put my fingertip on the trigger and squeezed off around. And missed two inches over its back. At that point, the ram sped out of the country, and that's when it hit, that this hunt missed by two inches. As heartbreaking as it was to think that we covered 70 to 80 miles on foot in about a seven and a half day span, saw some of God's most beautiful country and animals, it wasn't a failed hunt, it was a failed shot. And it's something I learned from, and it's something I hope you all learn from, and I hope to share with you at our Huskama Challenge or at one of our long range shooting courses in the field, how not to make that same mistake I did. But you know what? With a little bit of luck, there's gonna be a part two to this episode and that ram won't be so lucky. In my 10 plus year friendship with Joe and Vicki Latart, there was never a time where Joe talked about his business or his life in Alaska where Vicki wasn't part of the discussion. And about 30 days after my trip to Alaska, a perfectly seemingly healthy Vicki Latart passed away very, very suddenly. A huge loss to Joe and his family, a loss to all of their friends. Joe, God bless you. God bless Vicki's memory. We're all heartbroken for you, brother. We pray for you, and we dedicate this episode to the memory of our friend Victoria Latart. <laughs>